Well, if it looks like I'm shaking in my boots, I am. Your vision is clear. Last night was uh, the first sermon I've given in my 60 years of being on this earth. And uh, I just pray that that brings glory and honor to God. That's my, my goal today. So let's pray. Pray for me and pray, pray with me if you don't mind. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again, Lord, for a chance to use this broken vessel for your glory, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you've chosen this time and this place, hopefully to open the hearts of the people you love and to pour out your love in them and to draw them closer to you. Use me, my arms, my lips, my hands, my heart, my attitude for your glory. Let me hide behind you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, I was thinking a, a couple days ago about a little joke, and uh, basically uh, there were two guys who were out camping for about three or four months, and uh, a bear had come and eaten all their food, and they didn't know where to go. And they were very hungry, so uh, they started looking around the forage for food, and they found this mulberry bush, and the younger guy uh, started eating his mulberries like he had never eaten before. It just was ravenous, just eating them like crazy. And the older guy was just eating them, you know, a couple here and a couple there. And finally, they looked up. The older guy saw a bear and his cub, bear and her cubs coming by, and, and he started just shaking. And the younger guy was just eating like crazy. And the older guy was just, oh, no, uh, well. So the older guy said to the younger guy, aren't you scared? This bear is going to, he's going to kill us. And the younger guy is just eating and eating and eating. And the older guy said to the younger guy, what is the matter? Don't you know this bear can kill us? He's going to chase us and he's going he's to eat us. And the younger guy says, I'm not scared about the bear because I can run faster than you can. <laughs> <laughs> so they took off and the older guy got a burst of speed and the younger guy was behind him. The bear was chasing him and almost got the younger guy. The younger guy had to you know, put it in the fifth gear and just took off. And, the old, and as he took off, he was thinking, oh, my friend is going to get killed. My friend is going to get killed. So he, he said, Lord, please, close the mouth of the bear the way you closed the mouth of the lions when Daniel was in the lion's den. He said, oh, Lord, you, you know, if you don't do that, do me a favor. At least make the bear a Christian. So the bear was just about to, just about to kill him. And the bear stopped and said, Lord, bless us for the food I'm about to receive. For <laughs> So, you see, the bear was hungry, and the bear wanted to protect his cubs. So the title of my sermon is, Are You Hungry? And uh, we're going to read from some scripture, and the scripture is going to be John 6. We, 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 if you go there with us, John 6, verses 25 through 35. The key verse is going to be 35. And then we're going to flip over to Philippians uh, 4.19. When you get that, let me know by saying, amen. John 6, verse 25, key verse 35. We'll read, we'll read through until 35. Are we there? If you don't have the words, it should be on the screen. John 6, 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures for, to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give. Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Here's the key verse. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. In Philippians 4.19, it should be familiar to you. I'll read it if you don't want to flip there now. It's, um, and my God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Here is an account in the, in the New Testament uh, where the disciples are actually, they had seen the miracle of maybe Jesus 
breaking bread and uh, turning two fish and five loaves into food for thousands. And in all actuality, uh, it may have happened at least one more time before this, at least in some other uh, parts of the gospel, it was at least twice that this happened, that he did, he took a small amount of fish and a small amount of bread, he, he gave thanks, he broke and he gave, and, and they were just really, really enamored at this miracle of having such a small amount of food to feed thousands, multiple thousands. And um, I can imagine that the <laughs> that the disciples, had they seen this the first time, if it would have been me, I would say, whoa, did you see that? He took the small amount of bread and, and fish and fed all these people? That's amazing. But if, you know, if they're, they're humans like we are, if, as an example, they had seen that for the second time, they may not have been as excited about it. You know, I mean, sometimes we get complacent about miracles. In fact, there's miracles happening in our lives all the time, but we get complacent about it. I mean, when a child is born, that's a miracle. Amen. You know, and, uh, and some of us say, oh, yeah, well, I had another baby. Well, no, it's a miracle. And especially the, the vehicle, the wife, the mother uh, that gave birth. It's a miracle that she lives too. But my point, <laughs> no, hey, tell me about it. I watched the birth of all four of my daughters, and I got to tell you, it's, uh, it put a new perspective on, on life. So I'm glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> but, but my wife of uh, 34 years is Diane here, and she's given birth to four lovely daughters. But can you imagine if they saw that for the second time, they'd probably say, oh, yeah, we saw that before. When are you going to walk on water? Well, he did. And he had just walked on water, and now he's, the, the disciples probably are trying to tell other people, you know, we saw Jesus do this, and you should come check this out, because this man did this, this miracle. And he probably has, they probably brought some of the, you know, the hierarchy people, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to witness this. See, the Pharisees didn't know Jesus, and the Sadducees didn't know Jesus either. That's why they were sad, you see? So, uh... <laughs> Good one, huh? <laughs> but as it turns out, he, he's, he's, he says, you're looking for a miracle. That's why you're here. You're looking for a miracle. But in all actuality, I am the miracle. I am the miracle. You know, one of the things you want to be able to study in the Bible is anytime you see the word I am and God is saying that, whatever is after that is absolute. Now, what I mean by that is this. You can say, I am tired. You can say, I, I want to raise, or I, need, I am hungry. And it's only temporary. Because if you're tired, you'll be tired, and you can sleep, and you're okay. If you're hungry, you eat, and you know, you'll be okay. But if God says, I am, whatever's after that is absolute. And in fact, it's so tight. I mean, that word, the, the, the statement, I am, is so tight. When Moses asked, How, who should uh, I say sent you? You know, God could have told him who he was, but Moses would still have been listening today because God is so much of whatever he is all in all that Moses would have been dead and gone. He'd still be talking to you. And I'm in the bread of life and I am. In <laughs> Moses, can you hear me? <laughs> so he just said, I am that I am. Just to cut it short, Moses said, oh, I got it. I got it. You see? But my point behind it, if you ever see the Lord say, I am, whatever is after that is absolute. He says, I am the bread of life. Now, in the olden days, bread, in, that, in those days, bread was a very important staple in life. Here it may be rice and potatoes, but bread was eaten with every meal, along with a piece of flesh, may have been a piece of some meat or fish, and some veggies. So bread was very important, you know, is a very important part of their meals. And throughout the scripture, I did a little search. There were, the word bread is used 258 times in the Bible. In every book in the Bible, the word bread is in there. So do you think they're talking about bread? Do you think the Lord is talking about real bread? In this particular case, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever accepts me will never go thirsty. Now, I know a lot of us are saying, well, what is he talking about with that? Because I have to eat again. So let me do a little, uh, a little empirical study here, if you don't mind. This study I'm going to do right now, there's three rules. 
First of all, you have to participate. Second of all, you can't pass judgment on the person around you. And the third thing is, when you do such, do such and just reflect on yourself. So if I ask you to raise your hand, I want you to raise your hand and keep your hand up until I ask you to put it down. Raise your hand if you're hungry. Okay, keep it up. Now, raise your hand if you thought I was talking about food only. Okay, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. If you're hungry for attention, keep, put your hand up. If you're hungry for a raise, put your hand up. If you're hungry for recognition, put your hands up. If you, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, everybody. If you're hungry for love, put your hands up. Now look around. Everybody has their hands up. Almost. You see, it's <laughs> a couple of you didn't want to participate, but, but that's okay. See, my point behind it is we all hunger for something. Hunger is just an innate thing that we have as creatures, creations of God. Anything that grows is hungry. It has to fill an emptiness within themselves. So let me give you a little story about myself. I grew up in a little place called Buffalo, New York. And um, I was born there, and uh, I got to tell you that uh, we didn't have the options of going to church. <laughs> it wasn't like uh, uh, they used to call me another name, but I'll call you, I'll say it's Rocky. But uh, th that wasn't my home name, it was another name. But anyway, they said, uh, they didn't give me the option, do you want to go to church today? No, my mother didn't send us to church, she took us to church. And if she didn't take us to church, there was a bus that came right in front of our house that took us all the way across town to go to church. And I remember going to church and, uh, you know, for Sunday school, and after Sunday school, we would hear uh, the high heels on the wooden floor singing, what a fellowship. That was time to go upstairs. And then we had to take all the candy out of our pocket because we were eating candy during summer school. I mean, Sunday school. But my point behind is we went to church every Sunday, rain or shine. You heard the story in Buffalo. We walked to school in the snow both ways, barefooted, uphill. <laughs> but we went to church and there was no option so I grew up as a Christian I accepted the Lord in my life at eight years old and I'll never forget it that was the, that was a blessing for me at the time but I went to this little uh, university University of Rochester It was 80 miles away that's where I met my lovely wife some 40 years ago I know she doesn't look 40 I know I do that's another story but but as it turns out um, I went to the University of Rochester and when I came back for Thanksgiving, I told my mother, and I said, Mom, you got this Jesus stuff. And I didn't say stuff. I said a word that I would never repeat again. But I told her that. And she looked at me with a tear in her eye and said, Son, do what you have to do, but you'll be back. I eventually became a Muslim. I studied Islam. This was back in the day when that was very popular. I then studied, got away from that because I didn't see the truth in there. I saw some truth, but I saw some lie. Then I became uh, Judaism. I studied that. I saw some truth in that, but I saw the lie. Then I decided to study Hinduism. I saw some truth in that, and I saw the lie. Then I decided, let me try this thing called Buddhism. Study that, saw the truth in it, saw the lie. And I said, well, you know, let me try something else. Let me try this transcendental meditation. I tried that. Saw the truth in it. Saw the lie. I'm not denigrating you if you are part of that religion or any of that. This is just my, my, my take on it. And then I decided, well, you know what? There's no, I can't find the truth. I can't find the lie. I'm just going to go ahead and just go straight to where the devil wants me to go to. And I study this thing called Est, which definitely that's the devil. That's another story. Please don't let that offend you. But 18 years later, I had my roommate. We, I had a roommate in Hampton University, Hampton Institute. It's a school I went to also. And um, we, I had two roommates. And one of them found out that he, after six years in school, that uh, he needed a C to graduate. And he got a D. And he couldn't graduate. So he took his life. He, 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 he committed suicide. That was very tough on the second roommate and I to see our roommate take his life. But 18 years later in San Jose, that second roommate called me on my birthday, April 14th, and said, Rock, this is the last birthday I am going to wish you happy birthday. And he was calling me from New York, and I said, well, why? He says, because I have a gun to my head, and I'm going to take my life. 
And he says, but I thought about what we went through when we lost our roommate. And I just wanted to call you first. And I said, I won't say his name, but I said, why are you taking your life? He says, because I'm in this homosexual relationship and I don't like it. And out of nowhere, I said, you need Jesus. And I led him to the Christ. He's alive today. Oh, yeah. Glory to God. But when I said, you need Jesus, I looked around and said, who said that? <laughs> because Jesus said, you need me too. And I could not wait. That was a Friday. I couldn't wait to the Sunday to go to Church of Philadelphia, a church here in San Jose, to rededicate my life to Christ. I was like Usain Bolt. I was ready to go. In fact, the sermon started at 9.30. I couldn't wait until 10.30 before the, the altar call. I was saying, can you get to the part about, you know, come to give my life? And I've been back with the Lord ever since. That's my story. You see, I was hungry. I was hungry. What was I hungry for? You may think I was hungry for, I was, to, to find out what the truth is. No, I was hungry to be self-righteous because I wanted to know about all these religions. And today, I thought it was a waste of time, but I can, I can witness to every religion on the planet because I know where the truth is in theirs, but I know what the lie is too. The lie is they miss Jesus. See, they miss knowing that Jesus is God. They think he's a prophet, or they think he's just a miracle worker. But no, that's what they miss. There's some good in all those religions, but the big lie is they miss Jesus. So when you think about being hungry, there are three things I want you to consider. This. First of all, you have to identify your hunger. What are you hungry for? Then you want to isolate your hunger to make sure that it is exactly what you're hungry for as opposed to what you think you're hungry for. And then you want to eliminate your hunger. Now let's go about identifying what your hunger is. I, I say that because of this. Right now, if I ask you, are you hungry? Some of you are thinking food and you're saying, okay, yes, I'm hungry and I'd like to have some tea and crumpets right now. Others are saying, can I get a breakfast burrito? And some of you are probably saying, can I get some wontons? And somebody is saying, can I get some grits and eggs, you know? <laughs> but whatever your culture is, that's what you're feeling. But you know, sometimes we're hungry and we eat, and we're not really hungry. Can we talk? Sometimes don't you eat when you're not really hungry? It's just because it's there. Oh, it's lunchtime. Everybody's eating now. But are you hungry? No, you're just eating. So sometimes we are hungry and we are identifying uh, the hunger with the fact I just have to eat because everybody else is eating, but you're not really hungry. In fact, most of us do things out of a habit, but we don't know why we're doing that habit because we're just doing it from a customary routine procedure. You understand what I'm saying? So, so when you're hungry, you want to be able to identify what you're hungry for. Because right now, if you decide that you're hungry, you, you may see someone who is having some challenges with eating because they either don't eat too enough or they eat too much, and they just eat out of a habit of doing that. But you know, just like uh, you may have the habit of drinking, or you may have the habit of smoking, or you may have the habit of whatever you know, vice that you may use, some people have that vice and it's a cover-up to something else that's beneath that. So they think they're hungry for alcohol, or they think they're hungry for nicotine, or cocaine, or whatever drugs, but beneath that is the real hunger. So you want to isolate what the hunger is. I mean, have you known some people who says, yeah, well, I drink because I'm lonely? Well, isn't, they didn't drink because they needed to drink, they drink because they're lonely. That's the real hunger. So you really want to isolate your hunger and find out what it is you're hungry for. Because are you eating because, or do you want attention because, or do you need appreciation because, or are you lonely because, or do you want control because, or do you want to be right because? Because typically, we typically do things that are on the surface. We typically uh, 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 anneal some of our issues when they're right on the surface, but you've got to go deep and find out what it really is. Now, and this leads me to how you isolate that and not only isolate it, but eliminate it. 
Because, see, on the surface, this flesh that we have is going to have some desires. And, but beneath it, there's a bigger desire. But, you know, the Lord says, I will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. And I begin to think about that a lot. And I begin to think about, you know, here it is. We are people of habit. We're creatures of habit. We want to do things on a habitual scale, but we are almost scared to get our, all, of our, all of our answers answered from one particular source. And what I mean by that is this. You know, uh, I took a, a trip one time to this uh, ski resort, well, this ski area called Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I love skiing. I took about four or five friends with me. Well, they took me, really. And, um, <laughs> and it, was, uh, it was amazing. Um, it has snowed all day long. And after the snowstorm at night, uh, we ate, and they went to sleep, and I happened to look outside. It was a clear sky. I said, let me go walking. I put on my ski boots and my ski suit, and it was no moon out, but I looked at the snow, and there was no lights, and the snow was glistening. I said, what's causing the snow to glisten if there's no moon and no lights? And there were so many stars. I have never seen so many stars like that in my life. And you know, I put on my headphones, I was listening to some gospel music, and at the same time, this song by one of my favorite artists, Sarah Vaughn, came on, So Many Stars. Beautiful song. And I'm, I laid out in the snow and looked up at the sky, and I saw more stars than I've ever seen in my life. And the Lord said to me, and you worry about eating, and you worry about paying bills. And you worry about sending your kids in college. And I made all of this. And I made all of this for you to bring me glory. And you worry about people treating you wrong at work. And you worry about this. And you worry, why do you worry about that? I will supply all your needs. I span the universe. At the twinkling of the eye, I can bring manna down from heaven. What are you worried about? That was such an epiphany for me that I began to understand that I, when you search because you're hungry, you want to look at the source of where all supply comes from. Because, you know, sometimes we don't give credence to the fact that even as we breathe, the air that we breathe is a gift. It's a gift because some people can't breathe. We don't, we don't give credence to the fact that the Intels and the Googles, I used to work for these big companies, that we think that we can get our supply of all our food and all our stuff from Intel. Right. And I'm not picking on Intel. I used to work with them. But we, we tend to think that, okay, I'm going to get my money from there. I'm going to get this from Safeway. I'm going to get this from the doctors. And be, above all of that is him. So when we give thanks and glory to him, we're saying, thank you for feeding me. Thank you for the hunger that you fed, you fed me for. You know, if you look at it from a scientific standpoint, and I'm a scientist by training, at least, um, every living creature has a hunger, or every living thing. Even a blade of grass that catches a raindrop is hungry for that raindrop in order to grow. If you think about the, the smallest animal on the planet, it's called an amoeba. An amoeba is a one-celled animal, and it lives only about 36 hours. In the 36 hours, the first thing it does is eat. It eats, it eats, it eats, it eats. And if it's lucky enough, it procreates. Otherwise, it's going to die. If you think about another creature, like a bee, if you see a swarm, a nest full of bees, the job of the bee is to protect the nest so it can procreate. So it's hungry to protect the nest. That's what's in its ingrain. Now, you know, in a, in, a, in a nest, there's only one queen. There's only one female. And all the rest are males. Only one male gets a chance to be with the female. <laughs> and then she eats them after, after that. <laughs> and the rest are saying, okay, we're going to go work for you, baby. We <laughs> That's all good. I'm glad I'm not neither one of those bees. <laughs> but, 
But the blessed, the thing is, there's, the, the, in their makeup is a hunger to go get some pollen, to bring it back, to build the nest, to nurture, to nurture the eggs. And there in their nature is procreation. That's what they're hungry for. You think about a peacock. Anybody ever seen a peacock before? You know, a peacock, if you watch them, the only thing they do is eat and show off their feathers. And why are they showing off their feathers? To try and attract the female. You know, and you see a peacock in the zoo and he puts out his, her, he puts out his feathers and you can see that the female peacock is probably saying, nah, that's not good, that's J.C. Penney. I'm going to be, C, be a Maximania over here, you know. Or I want to see the coach feathers. What is this here? You know, and so another peacock would say, hmm, you like that? Oh, yeah, I like that. Let's go say goodbye I want those. <laughs> but my point behind it is this. Their job is to procreate and eat. That's their hunger. That's the only thing that's ingrained in their mind. But now when you come to humans, us, what do you hunger for? I can tell you the other day, I, I, I work up in Santa Rosa, which is not too far from here, about an hour and a half from here. And I was driving back yesterday, and I was right behind this really nice, brand new Ferrari. And I don't have a Ferrari, of course. I got a little old Mazda. But I was following this Ferrari, and he was just getting it. I said, I can keep up with you. Look at me, you know. <laughs> and I found myself enamored with this car, and I was hungry to drive this car. I said, I wish I could drive. I'll show them how to really roll in it, because I'd be all like this, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but my point behind is, we hunger for things like cars, for clothes. We hunger for attention. We hunger for recognition. We hunger for someone patting you on the back and saying, good job. You did this. You did that. There's a lot of things we hunger for want to dig deeper and find out why is it that I like that car? Well, I like that car because I think if I roll in it, then I get recognition. That's all it was about. I mean, I like speed too, but I, that's what it's about. So you have to look deeper. But God says, you know what? I will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. So when you look at him saying, I am the bread of life. Bread in this particular case is not talking about wheat. He's not talking about sourdough, not talking about French bread. He's talking about him. This is your bread. In fact, there have been fewer times than I can remember that I didn't read this as the first book, first thing I read every morning. When I wake up in the morning before I brush my teeth, I want to read the bread. I want to eat of the bread. And it's because this feeds me. He says, I am the bread of life. When, this, when I read this every morning, it gives me a, a push. Sometimes it gives me a slap, a loving slap. Sometimes it trains me. Sometimes it rebukes me. Sometimes it teaches me. But in all in all, it makes me a better person for him. Amen. And you see, in John, 1 John, it says, first there was the word, and the word was God. Well, the word, God, Jesus said, I am Bread, here is your bread. You see, a lot of times we tend to feed ourselves with the substance that goes in our bodies as opposed to the substance that goes in our spirit. And when you feed yourself with the substance that goes in your spirit, the body automatically gets taken care of. Because God is not going to let you feed up his spirit and be a starving little child. Now, when we think about starving, starving people now, I mean, if you think about what's going on in East Africa right now, there, it's a tragedy. It really is. It's a tragedy that you can eat today and throw some of your food away, and some of these children would gladly eat your scraps. But what are they hungry for? Think about it. You think they're hungry for food? They're hungry for rain. They're hungry for a, sol a solving of a political crisis. Beneath all that food, if they get the food, they're still going to have a political crisis or it's still going to be a drought. So they're hungry for peace. You see what I mean by being hungry? You have to isolate your hunger. You have to find out what is the root cause of your hunger. In Luke 11, uh, 11, Luke 11, verse 11 through 13, it says, Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If then, through your evil, 
if then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to all those who ask? You see, here it is. A son is looking for some food. He's hungry. So you wouldn't give him a snake or you wouldn't give him a scorpion. And then Jesus sort of switches it up and says, you know what? <laughs> food? You want the Holy Spirit. Oh, I can't eat the Holy Spirit. That's what some of us are saying. Can you put the Holy Spirit on a plate for me and put some, you know, some sauce on it and kick it up a notch? You know? <laughs> said, no. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you got everything. You have all you need. You don't need anything else but the Holy Spirit. Now, he said, now, wait a minute. Now, I haven't eaten in 21 days. You're going to tell me I see someone on the street who's starving like crazy, hasn't eaten anything, and just tell them, here, instead of going to McDonald's, here, take this dose of the Holy Spirit? Well, I can tell you, if you did that, it wouldn't be like that person would be any worse off. <laughs> It'd probably be a lot better off. And who knows, McDonald's, may, he may own the McDonald's in a couple of years, the way the Holy Spirit can work. So <laughs> my point behind it is the Holy Spirit is all you need for all of your hunger. Now, some of you are probably saying, now, what is he talking about? Intel was supposed to, or Google or some of these high tech companies were supposed to give me a raise and they passed me over because it's the economy. And you're telling me all I need is the Holy Spirit. Well, guess who feeds Intel? Guess who feeds Google? Guess who have provided for you through them? My point behind it is this. When you put all your eggs in one basket, if it's a basket that's fraught with the world, then you lose. But if you put all your eggs in one basket and it's the basket of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot lose. And I look at it from the standpoint that most of us, we tend to uh, try and... Uh, isolate our hunger or isolate the things we want to do and put it into compartments. Here's what I mean by that. If I said, uh, you know, you have a very contagious disease or we all have a very contagious disease, the first person or the first institute we're going to go to to get solved, that solved is our doctor or a hospital, right? We tend to compartmentalize it. I'm going to get my healing from the doctors. I'm going to get my food from Safeway or from the grocery store or from uh, McDonald's. I'm going to get my teaching from a teacher. And I'm going to get my, um, let's see, I'm going to get my, uh, my money for my job from this company. We tend to think that way and we get single track minded about it. Let me show you how slick some of these high tech companies are. Nowadays, back in the day when I, when I used to work, it was like you went to work and then you went home. Nowadays, they want you to stay there, don't they? <laughs> don't they? So don't they provide food? Yeah. And don't they provide a place to play games? And don't they provide a cot where you can sleep if you want to? <laughs> you know why? They're trying to be him. They're trying to provide you with everything so you don't leave, so they can wear you out and replace you. <laughs> I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what happened to me. In 1996, December 26, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Doctor said I had six months to live. I was in El Camino Hospital. Never forget it. My cancer was caused by stress, because I was putting the companies of the world, the high-tech companies, I was pretty, pretty high up in the high-tech company, and I was putting them first, putting God way third or fourth, putting my family down there. But I was working, 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 working. And uh, I'll never forget, December 31st is New Year's Eve. I was in El Camino Hospital. My four daughters and my lovely wife came to visit me and I had to let them know that the doctor said that I had six months. And when they left, I'll never forget it, the nurses were preparing for New Year's. I closed the door to my room and I started talking to someone. And I was the only one in there. You can imagine who that was. And the question came back to me, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? You know what it wasn't? Buy more houses, buy more cars, travel all over the world for this company because they, I like to talk, as you probably noticed. You know what it was? 
spend quality time with people I love. Spend more time with my daughters and my wife, but spend more time with him. And he said to me, are you going to believe me or are you going to believe doctors? I said, I believe you. He says, I have more work for you to do. And he said, doctors practice medicine. I am medicine. I haven't lost a patient yet. And so I'm cancer free today. You can give honor and glory for that. Yes, I lost my hair. Yeah. Through chemotherapy, I lost my hair. I used to have an afro this big. Don't believe. I got pictures to prove it. Then he knows because I met my wife at Xerox Corporation. I was walking down the hall for afro like this, and I saw one bigger than mine. It was hers. <laughs> And I said, she's the queen, I'm the king, I got to hook up with this sister here. It wasn't that easy, she played hard to get. She was <laughs> but see, uh, in Matthew 4, 4, it says, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, we don't live by bread alone. The Lord healed me. Now, I didn't tell you the rest of the story about when my roommate, I uh, actually uh, led him to Christ. That Sunday, when I rededicated my life to Christ, I called my mother back in Buffalo, New York. And I said, Mom, and I was in tears. I said, I'm back. And you know what she said? I've been praying for you every day for 18 years. My mother is a prayer warrior. She gets up at 6 o'clock every day, rain or shine, and goes with a group of people and pray. And I guess that's one of the reasons why I like to pray, too. But my point behind is, never give up. Never give up on your loved ones. Never give up on your circumstances. You see, we can't fathom getting all of our hunger fed from one source. But when the scripture in Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will supply all your needs according to this riches and glory, not you, but other people read it like, oh, yeah, my God is going to apply all of his needs or their needs, not my needs. And we, don't tend to, we tend to take it apart. My God will supply all. Well, no, not for me. It's not all. It's just some. You know, I got shoes. I got food, shelter, and clothing. But not, I'm not living large, and I don't have my health. So he's not going to supply all, just some for me. You see this pity party that we go in? And even sometimes we even say, oh, the, the, mate, the, the, the big guy. I'm saying I'm, I'm really enamored to sit behind this pulpit because some people have fed me from here that I just hold in high esteem for how the Lord uses them. And for me to stand here, I'm humbled. I really am. But my point behind is some that have stood behind this pulpit, I've mentioned one, Zach Putnam. I mean, they're going to, God is going to supply all his needs because he's large and in charge with the Lord. But no, you, you just got accepted. You accepted Christ just yesterday. He's not going to supply all your needs. You see how we think? We think because we just accepted the Lord that now we don't have all of the Holy Spirit. We only got a piece of him. You know? And we think because this guy here who's been preaching for 50 years and so, so much on, in line with the Lord that he gets all of him. Well, guess what? When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit comes in your life, you got all of him. And what I mean by all of him, I mean the all that allowed Moses to part the waters. I mean the all that allowed Daniel to uh, be saved from the lion's den. I mean the all that allowed David to kill Goliath. I mean the all that allow Elijah to cause, cause fire to come down from heaven. I mean the all that allow Jesus to turn water into wine. The same Holy Spirit is in you. All of it. Not a piece of it. All of it. So don't belittle yourself and say I'm not where somebody else is. Because God is like the... Let me use this analogy. I'm a scientist again. I'd like to use this analogy. Uh, Doug is the sound man back there, Okay. Doug, don't let your head get too big, okay? I don't want you to... Do if I use Doug as an analogy of God, he has a board, okay? 
And on that board, he can turn up the bass. He can turn up the treble. He can turn up uh, my voice. He can turn up the trumpets. He can turn up the violins. Everything, all, all he needs is on that board. Well, if the analogy is this. God, if you, if you have the Holy Spirit, God can turn up prophecy in you. He can turn up teaching. He can turn up uh, this. He can turn up whatever he needs according to his sovereign will. But it's all in you. If you accept him, you got it all. Amen. So just, you know, humble yourself before his mighty hand and he will exalt you in due time. <laughs> so here's what I want you to understand about Philippians 4.19. When he says he will supply all your needs, it's every one of them according to his riches and glory. And all your needs can be met real simply by accepting Christ in your life. So are you really hungry? And if you are, then you should look for where you can be fed. If you're hungry, let's eliminate your hunger because you go to 1 John 2, 1, and you're, he's the advocate, the righteous one. If you go to Revelations 1, 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If you go to Revelations 3, 4, he says, I'm the Almighty. Are you hungry? If you go to uh, Daniel 7, 19, he says, I am the Ancient of Days. If you go to Colossians 3, 11, he says, I'm your all in all. Tell, reminds me of another little story. I used to, as, as, as a child, my mother and father worked so hard that in the summertime, they used to send me and my sister down to North Carolina where they were born, and we used to stay with my grandmother for the summer. And my grandmother didn't have hot and cold running water, didn't have a bathroom in the house. It was an old 100-year-old slave house that she lived in, but she was happy as can be. And in fact, the house was so old that we had to put rags in the floorboards to keep the snakes from coming up in it. But my grandmother used to say at four years old, she used to say, you know, son, and she used to dip snuff. I don't know y'all know what snuff is. You put it right here, you know. And she used to tell you, yeah, and she said, hell, I used to have to empty that spaghetti. Oh, I hated that. A little Maxwell house can. Oh, another story. But anyway, but she used to say, you know, son, when you got Jesus, you got everything. And I, at four years old, I said, all right, Grandma, yeah, you're right. You're. And, you know, years went by when I used to go down there. And I remember at 14 years old, I had a little old paper route in Buffalo, New York. And I was making about 50 bucks a week. That's a lot of money back then. And my father and my mother told me 50 bucks a week working part-time is more money than your grandfather works, makes at the gin, at the, at the cotton gin in, in, in North Carolina. So I remember I went down one summer, and I took $100 with me. And I gave it to my grandparents. That's all my money. I gave it to them. My grandfather cried like a baby in front of me. He says, thank you. But my grandmother pulled me over and said, son, when you got Jesus, you got everything. She didn't have hot and cold running water in the house. We had to use the outhouse I hated to use. And I said, grandma, you on that snuff. You don't know what's up. <laughs> I got a bicycle. I got, I, got a, I got porcelain running water in my house. But you know what? She told me something that just came to fruition when I found out that I had cancer because I needed a healer and I had everything. So today, if you're looking, if you're hungry, look for the one that can solve your hunger. Because if you look in Hebrews 2.11, he's the author and finisher of your faith. In Isaiah 15.3, he's the arm of the Lord. In Matthew 3.17, he's the beloved son. In John 6.35, he's the bread of life. In, eight, in, in Jeremiah 8, 22, he's the bomb of Gilead. He'll heal you. In, in John 14, 16, he's the counselor. If you, need a, if you need a lawyer, he is your counselor. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? In Isaiah 28, 16, he's the precious cornerstone. In Luke 1, 7, 78, he's day star. In uh, John 10, uh, 7, he's the gate of life. In Romans eleven twenty six, he's your deliverer. In, uh, in 2 Peter 1 and 19, he's a bright and morning star. When you've been crying all night and you need light, in the morning is that morning star waiting for you. In uh, 1 Peter 5, 4, he's the chief shepherd. Are you hungry? Are you hungry? Because he's your rock. He's your deliverer. He's the maker of all things. He's the redeemer. He's the majesty of glory. He's the shelter from the storm. He is your all in all. He is the ever-present help in time of troubles. Are you hungry? Stand up, please. Stand up, please.